Hey guys, good evening. Dan Blotz here again. I want to thank you for tuning in. Thank you for those of you that have subscribed to the channel. It's uh, it's kind of neat to see people that actually want to hear the gospel and hear the word. And uh, hopefully I'll be able to bless you each time you tune in. I want to talk today about psychology in the church. A large percentage of Christianity is nothing more than psychology. In psychology and Christianity are in stark contrast one to another. They don't fit together. I know I hear Christians sometimes talk about Christian psychology. I, I think that's a, an oxymoron. I don't think those two can be put together. They're, they're opposed to one another. See, in psychology, there's this idea that basically you are a, a good person, but you've been trapped by a few bad rituals, bad habits, bad ideas, and you need to be broken free from them. And so the first thing you need to do in psychology is to admit that you have a problem and then confess that problem before people and identify yourself with that problem. So much so that if you go to Al Alcoholics Anonymous, and I'm sure you've all seen this on shows or t on movies or whatever, an alcoholic will come in to the, to the meeting and say, Hi, my name is Dan and I'm an alcoholic. And they will respond and say, Hi, Dan. And that's just how you identify yourself from now on. In order for you to have victory, and this works, I'm not, not dissing it in that sense, in order for you to have victory over alcoholism, you need to recognize that you have a problem with alcoholism. That's partially true with uh, victory in the gospel as well. But it goes further. In Alcoholics Anonymous, you never stop being an alcoholic. You are an alcoholic in remission. Y you stop drinking. I've been in remission for four years, five years, whatever it might be. And you finally give back in and, you, and then you're back in, into alcoholism. And so you're always remembering that you're an alcoholic. And so you set up principle-based ways for you to govern your own flesh. You understand what I'm saying? You put rules and laws in place in your life so that your mind will have a more dedicated cause or a more dedicated path to having victory over your body. And if somebody doesn't have victory through the gospel, I would highly recommend this. You don't want to continue living in sin. You know, so even someone who's not a Christian who doesn't believe the power of the gospel, it's good for them to stop sinning. I'm not against that. But if you look in the book of Colossians, chapter 2, I believe, deals with the idea of psychology and philosophy. It says this in verse 20, Wherefore, if ye be dead with Christ from the rudiments of the world, why, why as though living in the world are you subject to ordinances? And then he puts in parentheses, touch not, taste not, handle not, which are all to perish with the using after the commandments and doctrines of men. So what I gather from this is that he says, you're no longer living in the world. You're no longer subject, subject to principles of this world. As a Christian, you are so far above the, the problems in this world that he says it would be a base thing. It would be lowering yourself. Why, as though living in the world, are you subject to ordinances? Do you really need the law? Do you need principles? Do you need psychology to govern your flesh? Because then it's not a work of God anymore. Well, some would say, but I'm using psychology along with God's help in my life and so on and so forth. But either way, you get the credit then. As long as it's you putting it into action, as long as it's a formula and you can say, I do this, then I do this, then I do that, and then I'm free from sin. Then you have followed a step-by-step -step procedure, a 12-step program or a four-step program, and you're living your life based on touch not, taste not, handle not. And if you do those three things, then you will be free from sin. Why, as though subject to ordinances, or why, as though living in this world, are you subject to ordinances? He's like, he's, he's baffled, he's b beside himself. Like, what, what in the world are you thinking? Why, as if you are still living in this world, are you subject to ordinances? The whole passage, if you read all of Colossians, and I'd love to go through it sometime with you all, he says, we are no longer in this world. In fact, the next chapter begins with this comment. It says, if ye then be risen with Christ... Seek those things which are above, where Christ sitteth on the right hand of God. Set your affection on things above, not on things on this earth. And I used to think that that was 
Paul saying, don't set your affection on cars and trucks and cool things, or don't set your affection on worldly pleasures or goods and whatever else. And maybe it includes that, but the context is laws, principles, ordinances. Don't set your affection on a certain way of living or a certain principle-based approach to overcoming sin. Rather, he says, set your affection on things above, where Christ sits at the right hand of God. Our victory over sin, our conquering fleshly appetites in this world, comes from Christ. It comes from us being seated together with Christ in the heavenly places. The reason I am free from sin today is not because I took the right steps in my life. The reason I am free from sin today is because 2,000 years ago, Jesus died on the cross, He rose again, and God baptized me into that body, as I've shared with you many times before. And now I am currently, me, I am currently seated with Christ in the heavenly places at the right hand of God. Now, do you think that person lives in sin? Absolutely not. I am not a slave to sin any longer. I have been baptized into his body. I am free and I am seated with Christ in the heavenly places. Now, if you take the opposite approach, many times it will appear very wise. In fact, at the end of chapter 2, if you're reading along with me, after he says, touch not, taste not, handle not, which all are to perish with the using, he says, which things indeed have a show of wisdom. So if you follow the principle-braced approach, if you follow the uh, psychological approach to things, psychology, he says, it will have a show of wisdom, meaning it will look very wise. Man, you're very disciplined, very orderly, very on top of it, you know. You're, you're really clear that you're not going to mess this up. It has a show of wisdom in will worship. Will worship. It's, I'm going to worship. You're trying desperately to get your mind to do the right thing. Worship is a spontaneous thing. When you are consumed with the thought of how good God is, worship erupts from your soul. When you recognize the goodness of God and how gracious He is, it will cause a celebration in your heart that is worship. He says, rather, this principle-based approach, touch not, taste not, handle not, it will have a show of wisdom in will worship. You're using your strength of will. And that says, and humility. Many of these people are these woe is me kind of Christians where they're like, oh no, I'm nothing special. They're, you know, humble mouthed. They, they try desperately to sound very humble, to sound very spiritual and godly. And yet it appears wise and it doesn't really have the fruit of it. So it'll have the show of wisdom and will worship and in humility and neglecting of the body, not in any honor to the satisfying of the flesh. So these people will sometimes become ascetics, where they will become monks, perhaps. They'll live their life in misery and in discomfort, and they'll put on rough clothes like these, people, these monks would do. They'll sleep on concrete floors. This is the extreme end of it. But many Christians, I myself was guilty of this, I would put my body through rigorous things, and I would tr try to harm myself in order to have victory. Now, I'm not saying there's not a time for fasting and praying and, and telling your body what to do. Absolutely, there is. But in order for you to have victory over sin, true victory, it will not come through you disciplining your flesh. It will come through recognizing that my flesh was worthless. In opposition to psychology, where you're slowly fixing up your body, slowly bringing your body into deeper and deeper subjection, maybe fixing up one part and then the next part and then the next part. God's not into that business. He's not a surgeon that's continually operating, or he's not a, a mechanic that's slowly tinkering with your motor. Instead, he says, this thing is worthless. This flesh is too sinful, and he puts it off. He cuts it away. He baptizes it together with Christ. He buries it in the grave, and then he raises it to new life. Christianity is a miracle. Walking by faith is of God. It is not an issue of your flesh. And it might not look as humble sometimes. It might not look as neglectful of the body. But there's a freeness. There's a liberty in the spirit when someone is walking after the spirit and not fulfilling the lusts of the flesh. All right, I'm going to wrap it up there. God bless you.